Looking again at verses 31 to 33, I'm going to ask you if you would to simply stand with me. And I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you don't, we have the text on the screen. I much prefer for you to look at it in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, then we will make one available to you at the end of the service if you'll simply inquire. Follow along as I read Mark 8, 31 to 33 in the English Standard Version. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. The challenge I have when I come to this text is twofold. I don't want to, by my life or my words, play the role of the devil in obscuring the person and work of Jesus Christ. Nor do I want to be found guilty by him of thinking like other men rather than thinking the things of God. I pray that for you as well today. Thank you. Be seated, please. Before this, prior to this passage, Jesus, if you back up a couple of passages, had scolded them. Do you not yet understand? And then you come on down to the verses immediately preceding this passage, and he asked them, who do men say that I am? And, and they gave some answers. And I, I pointed out at that time that every answer was a dead person who had come back to life. That, that would be what the populace said. Well, John the Baptist, they, but he's, he was beheaded, so for you to be John the Baptist, you have to be John the Baptist come back to life. Elijah. Of course, Elijah was taken up in a chariot. He's no longer here. Or one of the prophets, and all the prophets were also dead at this time. So, so the answer that the disciples heard the people talking about was, is, is this Jesus of Nazareth? Could he be John the Baptist? Come back, you think? Could he be Elijah? Come back? Then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Because folks, it doesn't matter nearly so much what the crowd, what the culture says about Jesus. What matters is what you and I say about Jesus. Of course, Peter answered spot on. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. When we piece together Mark's telling of this and Matthew's telling of this, you get that complete answer. In Matthew, this same passage, Jesus commends Peter, says, what you've just spoken, you didn't figure out by listening to the crowd. What you've just spoken came to you as revelation from my Father. And Peter, what you just confessed will be the reality upon which I will build my church, my ecclesia, my assembly of called out ones that I've called out of the culture to come into this new humanity, this, this new citizenry, this follower of Christ designation. And in saying that, he said, don't tell anyone else. And we've seen this periodically throughout the Gospel of Mark, don't tell anyone else. He, heal somebody, don't tell anyone. And I submitted to you then when we looked at it that, that it'd be the hardest thing to keep a secret. If you were the paralytic, the people knew about you and your pitiful condition, that your friends had to carry you around on a mat, and someone sees you skipping down the street whistling, it'd be hard to keep that to yourself, wouldn't it? But the point of Jesus doing that, this, this whole messianic secret what it, is what it's called, 
was that he was going to be revealed on his terms. Not on someone else experiencing his goodness and grace and then themselves coming up to say what he is, who he was going to be. And as you read this passage, if you've been tracking with us through Mark, you, you've got to feel a sense of, of angst on the part of the disciples. They come to him at one point and they say, Jesus, what you, <laughs> you've offended the Pharisees. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the, the ones in the disciples' minds who would be the ones who would, would give him a coronation or not, who would come out publicly and say, you people need to listen to him, he's the Messiah. That was the thinking of the disciples. They thought he would need the Pharisees and the scribes the chief leaders to anoint him. Messiah means anointed, that they, he would need their anointing for him to be uh, in the fullness the Messiah. So you've got to get a little bit of sense of angst on their part when he tells them in this next passage what's going to happen to him and who, whose hands will be guilty of perpetrating this on him. So I want us to look today, again, at these two headings that we just briefly touched on last, last week that are found in this passage. First, Jesus begins to speak of his death and resurrection, and we see that in verse 31, carried over to the first part of verse 32. Then second, Jesus rebukes Peter for worldly thinking. Rest of the passage, 32b verses of all, all the way to 33. Let's look at this together in the time that we have remaining. First of all, Jesus begins to speak of his death and resurrection. There it is in verse 31. He began to teach. He began to teach them. If you go through Mark, and I'll read these couple of passages in a few minutes, and then go through Matthew, you'll discover that on at least three occasions recorded in Matthew and in Mark, Jesus told them about the impending suffering and death and resurrection. He spells out for them what his experience is going to be, what will become the gospel message of Christ living, dying, rising again. So he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. You remember now, early on in the, in the gospel account, he spoke in parables. They asked him, why do you speak in parables when you're among the crowd? He said, because they, they're, they've not been given to see the kingdom of heaven like you have. I speak in parables to the crowds. I speak plainly to you. Remember Mark now, who, who wrote this gospel account, who is taking, we believe, taking Peter's memoirs of his life with Christ, those three and a half years he spent with him, wants us to know that he, it wasn't in veiled speech, it was plain. Now, brothers and sisters, there may be people all around us, people in your family, your sphere of friends, who reject the idea that Jesus Christ is the only way but it's not a confusing message. It's not an unclear message. It's not cloudy. It is a plain, straight up, matter of fact reality. And again, I would say that if you had your mind set up to think that Jesus would need to curry the favor of the religious elite, and then you've seen as you move through Mark, you've seen the different times that they have come to him to trip him up, ask him a question he can't possibly answer without getting in trouble. That had to bother you if you were one of the twelve. But what he says here had to send shivers up and down your spine. The Son of Man. Daniel spoke of him in, in the apocalyptic literature and the prophets. The Son of Man coming. It was Jesus' favorite designation of himself. The Son of Man. Fully man. As Josh said, fully man and fully God. But not a ghost. The Son of Man, the apocalyptic 
designation for the Messiah who would come from God to deliver Israel from under the feet of its enemies and to set up the rule of God. The Son of Man, he says, must suffer many things. It's not optional. He speaks this plainly, and you're going to see in a, few, in a couple of verses that Peter didn't take him at his word. Must suffer many things, be rejected. Notice the crowd. It's interesting that he does not mention the Romans in this. He'll have an encounter with Pilate after he's been mocked and abused. And Pilate will say in later gospel accounts, don't you realize the authority I have in my hands? I have authority to take your life if I want to. And Jesus just dismisses it and says, no man takes my life. I lay my life down. I take it up. And any authority you have has been given to you from above. In other words, you're not in control of this, Pilate. But this crowd he mentions here, the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, who make up a body, an assembly called the Sanhedrin. They will sorely punish me. They will have me put to death. But I will rise three days later. They have seen him bring the dead back to life. But how could the one who had been bringing the dead back to life, if he were killed, bring himself back to life? There was mystery still here, but he is speaking plainly. He begins to speak of this, of the core of the gospel. So that, and, he, and we're taught here that however we see Jesus, when he's healing, when he's teaching, when he's, when he's being kind and merciful, we've got to see him through gospel lenses. Everything he does in the gospels, he does pointing to this eventuality. And these who had been with him the longest, these who had walked with him in the day, who had slept in the open at night, who had gone in some houses where they were allowed to stay, traveling with him, these 12 that he handpicked, hear this, and Mark says, because Peter told him, and think about Peter being the one that told him. Peter's the one, that the next verse or two messes up. Peter says to Mark, and it was plain when he said it. Now, boys and girls, men and women who may not have confessed Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know the gospel is plain and simple. The challenge to you is to put your trust, commit your life, turning away from your sinful ways, turning away from man-centered thinking, to God-centered thinking, we're going to develop this in a minute here, to trust Jesus Christ as God's Son who came, lived a perfect life, died a death in your place and rose from the grave to show that He indeed had the power, the authority from God to forgive your sins if you will trust in Him. It's that simple. I'm going to read these two other passages in Mark before we move on. Look real quickly at Mark 9, 30-32. He's still keeping some secrets from the public. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, here, this is, this is a recurring thing. We have three, three of these recorded. I have no doubt that he told them this more than three times. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. This is... This is later on, now this is after the episode we're looking at today, verse 32, but they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. They've already gotten the do you not understand when they were, when they were chiding one another for not having enough bread on, on one of their trips. They were afraid 
The silly thing is, folks, he knew what was in their hearts. <laughs> they weren't keeping anything from him. But again, he tells them this. Look at Mark 10, 32 to 34. Now they were passing through Galilee in the previous passage. They're now on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. It's, it's one of those times when apparently the veil was pulled back a little bit and they, they saw something. They saw something. They saw something in him as he was walking ahead of them. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him saying, See, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. What would Jesus have us know as he teaches repetitively here at recorded in Mark's gospel, teaches the same thing repetitively in Matthew's gospel, what would he have us to know? That when he was taken, arrested, scourged and mocked and beaten, and placed up on a cruel cross to die, that that did not deter him from his mission. That was the completion of his mission. second thing I want you to see is when Jesus rebukes Peter for worldly thinking. Verse 32b, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. First of all, that just, that's bone chilling. What kind of false boldness do you have to correct the Messiah? It betrays an impetuosity that sadly too often we manifest as well. It's about how our thinking is shaped. We're going to see that. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Now, Peter took him aside and rebuked him. We don't know that the other disciples picked up what was going on. Matthew's gospel fills it in and tells us, he told him, Lord, that's not, that's not going to happen. <laughs> in the upper room later on, when he's talking about denial coming, Peter says, ah, I won't deny you. The others may, but I will not deny you. I'll defend you. So we have this little discussion going on, and Peter, Jesus turns, talking to Peter, but a voice that could be heard by the rest of the twelve. Get behind me, Satan. Now, folks, that right there should stop us in our tracks. Get behind me, Satan. Satan, you see, is the thief that Jesus describes in John 10. 10 he, he comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. There is a devil, he is real. And he wants your soul. And if he can't have your soul because your soul belongs to Jesus Christ, then he will take whatever you will let him have. He will take your witness. He will take your joy. He will take your, your confidence. He will take your, your, your uh, assurance. Because all he knows to do as the prince of the power of the air, as the fallen archangel, is to kill, steal, and destroy and for Jesus to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're trying to kill my mission. You're trying to steal who I am. And you, you, if you could, by your well-intended but misplaced desires, you would destroy the very gospel. Because if Jesus Christ does not submit himself to the cross and hang there on the cross and experience the wrath of God upon him, then there is no gospel. If he does not die and rise from the grave, there is no gospel. There's no good news. It's a strong rebuke. 
And here he tells us why he rebuked him. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You're thinking like a man. A mere man. I mentioned a passage last week to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I don't have it on the, on the screen for it. Listen to this. Turn in your Bibles if you would. Verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Paul's teaching about what, what happens to someone's thinking when they become a Christian. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all and therefore all have died. So Jesus' death for the people for whom he died will ultimately, infallibly, have an effect upon them that Paul calls dying. You're going to see this next week, Lord willing, as we look at Jesus' call to discipleship. And he died for all that those who live, there's this dying to self produces a life lived very differently. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And then listen to what Paul says now, but what's the result? From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ has reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Peter, you are not thinking the things of God. Your mind is not on... See, Paul says when he was very religious, when he was, when he was a Pharisee, and on mission from the Sanhedrin to stamp out Christianity, the followers of the way, they called them. That as Saul, he had his mind on the things of man. He saw Jesus simply as a, as a mere human, another one of these false messiahs who was stirring up trouble for Israel. And if it kept up, Rome would come down with a heavy boot on the neck of Israel. Paul, Saul was sent to stamp that movement out. And so he viewed every Christian, he viewed their head, Jesus, as just a, he's by the flesh. But he says when, when he was saved, now I view no one any longer by the flesh. It's his way of saying, I set my mind on the things of God. I think, as one fellow I heard speak years ago, I, I've learned to think Christianly. thinking like a Christian. Peter was thinking like a mere man. Jesus said, you need to think the things of God. So I want to ask you this morning as we close. What, what is the primary input that shapes your thinking? Just owning a Bible doesn't necessarily change your thinking. Member of a church, doesn't necessarily think, change your thinking. Listen to Proverbs 23, 23. And I want you to take this home with you and chew on it. The proverb writer says, speaking of these wisdom exhortations, buy the truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, understanding. Buy the truth. Place such value on the mind of God, which means you will place value on the Word of God, that you will check your thoughts by the Word and through the counsel of people who love you who will say, what does the Scripture say to that? We repeat nearly every Sunday here and have for almost 10 years. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. I think most evangelicals, most Baptists have no problem with inerrant. 
It contains no errors. Infallible, the nature of it, the author behind it is it's incapable of errors. It's the all-sufficient part that I think we trip up on. When we make life decisions, do we seek for light from the Scriptures? Mark it down. Jesus said Peter was playing the devil when he was thinking like a mere man. What influences your thinking? Brothers and sisters, there's, there's a, many versions of the Bible, many of them very good versions out there. There's the Bible in large print. There's the Bible that you can put on your smartphones, on your pads. It's on CD, MP3. It's in Braille for those who can't read, who are blind. I had a fellow say to me one time, years and years ago, when I was talking to him about, about the salvation of his, of his daughter and the young man she was with. And I kept appealing to him from the Scriptures. And he said this to me, he said, you know, preacher, I run heavy equipment at work. Now, when I first started that, they gave me a manual I needed to read so I'd know how to run that heavy equipment. He said, but when I got comfortable and good with how to run it, I put the manual down. Preacher, you need to put the manual down. I said, well, if what I'm telling you is not anchored in the Word, I have nothing worthwhile to say to you. I wouldn't even encourage you to listen to me. See, folks, my concern is has been that we will tout the authority of Scripture, but we do not immerse ourselves in the Scripture sufficiently for us to experience and then to express its sufficiency in our thinking. We go emotional, and I think I've heard more in recent weeks about just go with your heart, just go with your heart. Well, I, I, we just felt this. I just felt this. I, 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 the heart, the scripture says, is deceitful and desperately wicked. And what I, what I try to do, and I pray that you do that, and, I, and I'm willing to walk along beside you, we help one another in this, is let the scripture search our heart. Search me, O oh God. Try my ways, my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, O oh God. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. And the moment I put down the torch and say, I'm going to feel my way along, it's dangerous. For what it can do to our souls and what it can do to the souls of those we influence. Meditate upon Proverbs 23, 23, please. Ask yourself this. Have I found anything more valuable than the truth of God's Word? Do I act and live as if I've found something more valuable than the truth of God's Word? Would Jesus say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. You have, you, your mind is set upon things above and not on things below. Well done. You, you are thinking the things of God. You're thinking Christianly. Or would he say, Satan? You think like mere mortal men. You think like your culture. It's strictly an appeal. And thank God when you read Peter, go over and read 1 Peter again, looking at this passage, where he talks about how precious the Word is. We were born again by the incorruptible Word of God. It's desire the pure, sincere milk of the Word. 
Peter learned his lesson in time. We need to exhort one another to be sure that we are learning this lesson. That your mind is set and influenced and shaped by the truth of God. And if you feel the Spirit is leading and impressing, then the Spirit will not be offended if you check that by the Word. Because He's the one Jesus said would lead us into all truth. Jesus began to unveil himself to them. He'll do it time and time again. As Joshua said, I'm so grateful. 2,000 years on this side of the cross, we can look back through the lenses of the completed scriptures. And we who are Christ's followers with the indwelling spirit, spirit of God to teach us to be our teacher, to chide us, when we get out of step with him. To rebuke us when we look for another path that does not have the light of the word upon it to guide us. We have the full revelation of Jesus Christ to us in this book. My appeal to you today. Summer's passing away. Fall is coming to renew some things in your own life. Renew Bible reading. If you do that and you've gotten out of the habit of it because of a hectic summer, renew Bible reading. Join us on Wednesdays for praying through the scriptures. We have no guarantee that God will hear and answer prayers that we utter unless they're asked in his name and in his will but I promise you, he answers the prayers of this book. His very reputation is tied to it. Oh, I pray for a revival of biblical thinking. Because folks, if it's not, each one of us will get picked off one by one by the enemy of our souls who will whisper what we're feeling what we should feel. Follow your heart on this. Jesus has a different word. Think like God. What will we do? Let's pray.